If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And if you didn't bring a Bible, you'll find Bibles in the chair pockets around you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Let's pray. Father, we are gathered here this morning as an acknowledgement that you are God that you are worthy of this sacrifice of our time, Lord, that you are worthy of our worship. You tell us, Father, in your word, that the sin of the first man and the first woman was that even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. And we've inherited that tendency, Father, of not truly glorifying you as God or being thankful. Father, I pray that as we approach this Thanksgiving day, you would help us to glorify you as God and be thankful. For you are the giver of all that is good in our lives. Every breath we take, every beat of our heart, every morsel of food we eat, every drop of water we drink, all the friends and family members who are blessings in our lives, all the beauty of your creation, everything that is good in life has come from you. Your word tells us most clearly that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Father, I thank you for your great goodness. We, as a congregation this morning, thank you for your great goodness. We thank you for your word. And I pray now, Lord, that you would set a guard over my lips, that as I speak your word, you would help me to speak it with truth. I pray, Lord, that you'd give understanding to those who are gathered here, and that you'd be glorified among us today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this coming Thursday is the day our nation has set aside as Thanksgiving. A day to reflect on and express gratitude for the blessings of life. And we are a blessed people. The gifts of health, family and friends, the freedoms that we even still enjoy as Americans clothing, shelter, food, and countless other gifts with which God has graced our lives. But of course, the greatest of these gifts is the gift of Jesus and the relationship with God that Jesus has made possible. In this passage we opened up with this morning, the Apostle Paul is talking about the way in which he had shared the message of Jesus with the Corinthians. He starts in verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. 
For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. You see, before Paul had come to Corinth, he had attempted to share the gospel in Athens. Acts chapter 17 records Paul's words to the Athenians at the Areopagus, a forum in which philosophical presentations were commonly made. And Paul had made an eloquent and insightful presentation of the gospel there, but the response had hardly been overwhelming. Some men joined him and believed, Acts 17.34 tells us, but most had either scoffed or remained skeptical, despite Paul's logical and persuasive presentation. So when Paul came to Corinth, he determined he would use a different approach. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So does that mean then that the intellectual content of the gospel doesn't matter? That reasoning and persuasion have no part to play in sharing our faith? And of course the answer is no. In fact, Paul goes on in verse 6, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. What's Paul referring to here when he mentions the wisdom of God in a mystery? The hidden wisdom which God ordained for our glory. He's speaking about the gospel. About the fact that God had moved to save the world through the coming and sacrifice of Jesus. It's a mystery because it's a truth that remains hidden until God reveals it. It's hidden wisdom because it has to be revealed by God and doesn't line up with the philosophy of the world. It doesn't come to us naturally. A man-centered perspective believes that we should be able to make ourselves worthy of God and not have to depend only on what God has done for us. And even if we have to depend only on what God has done for us, why would that include the need for God the Son to take on human form and die for us? How could God the Son humble Himself in such a way to become like us, to die on a cross? There was no more humiliating death than death on the cross. Very few, if any, humans would give His life for another human in that way, let alone God. God. In fact, Paul goes on to point out in chapter 2, verse 8, that if any of the rulers of this age had known who Jesus was, the long-awaited Messiah, the Son of God, they would never have crucified Him. But they didn't know. They didn't recognize Him for who He was. They had the wisdom of men, but not the wisdom of God. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory so Paul goes on to write in verse 9, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. Paul's speaking here specifically about the blindness of the natural man to the gospel. But the principle expressed applies to the blindness that the natural man has to all of the extraordinary purposes of God. Just as humans missed what God was doing through Jesus, so humans don't even have a clue as to what God has waiting for those who place their faith in Jesus. If they had known who Jesus really was, they wouldn't have crucified Him, Paul tells us in verse 8. Just like if people really knew all that God has prepared for those who trust in Jesus, no one would want to leave this world without a relationship with Jesus. But that's the blindness of the natural man to God's wisdom. Man's wisdom says 
This world is all there is and you better go for all you can go for while you can go for it. God's wisdom says, surely there is a hereafter and your hope will not be cut off. Man's wisdom says, live for number one. Focus on building your own kingdom. God's wisdom says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Man's wisdom says, lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. God's wisdom says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Man's wisdom says, you need to do whatever you need to do to make sure you're happy. God's wisdom says, if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you'll lose your life for my sake and the gospels, you'll find it. Over and over again, there's a dichotomy between man's wisdom and God's wisdom. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 tells us there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. And so Paul writes in verse 9, But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And then he continues in verse 10, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Because of the blindness that we have to God's wisdom, there's no way apart from God's moving in the life of a person that any person would ever come to a genuine understanding of his need of a Savior or of the sufficiency of Jesus as that Savior. Nor would he ever come, come to understand the life that God has waiting for those who come into relationship with Him as a result of their trust in the Savior. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. Which is just another way of God's telling us that if we think God has blessed us up to this point, we haven't seen anything yet. For those who are believers, the best is still to come. And that revelation truly is amazing when you think about it. That everything we have experienced and will experience in this world is nothing compared to what's to come. I remember one winter's day in West Virginia. It was actually closer to evening and had snowed all day. There was a mantle of snow over everything. And I decided I would take a walk. I walked down the road that was past our home and there wasn't anything else on the road. Not a car, not a person, not a cat or a dog. The road was covered in several inches of snow. The ground was covered in snow. The rock face beside of me was draped in snow. The trees were laced with snow. The river was frozen over and snow covered. And snow continued to fall heavily from the gray sky. And there was such a stillness, a peacefulness. And in the growing twilight, such a quiet beauty. I don't think I've ever seen another winter snowfall quite like that. I remember when I was in California on a summer missions trip and my other two missions team members and I had gone camping in the Sierra Nevadas with a large youth group from the church that we were serving at that week. We actually had to hike to the place where we camped. There wasn't a road that went there. So we hiked several hours in the, into the mountains and finally reached our campsite. I remember going out the next morning to read my Bible and pray by the lake where we had camped. I sat down on this massive rock that was planted on the edge of the lake and stared out over the lake at water that was bluer than any water I'd ever seen. And the water was there in the lake as still as though it were frozen. It was bordered on all sides by gray rocks and scraggly green pines and canopied by a blue cloudless sky. It was one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen on earth. I remember the first time I saw the ocean. Some friends from, Cali from, some friends from college and I had gone on a road trip to California after my last year in college 
And we drove straight onto the beach at Santa Monica. You can't do that now, but you could do it then. I actually saw the Pacific Ocean before I saw the Atlantic Ocean. We parked our car and walked onto the beach and I saw the ocean and was awestruck. I thought it was one of the most amazing sights I'd ever seen. Water as far as the eye could see and till finally it just disappeared into the horizon. The waves coming in, lapping up against the sand and then lifting back out. I just sat down there on the beach and stared. I don't even know how long, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I just sat there and stared. I remember one morning when I was in a motel in southern West Virginia, I was working with the Governor's Summer Youth Program and was one of the regional directors and we were having a conference at this state park. And the motel at the state park sat high atop one of the mountains. And I woke up that morning and opened the curtains. There was a large picture window in the motel room. And I opened the curtains and looked out and then I had to do a double take. I saw the tops of the green mountains that were at a lower elevation than the mountain on which our hotel sat. And there just below the peaks of those mountains was a layer of fog, but it looked like a cloud, like the top of a cloud when you're in an airplane. And it looked like the mountains were peering up through those clouds like islands in a white sea. And then up above those green mountains, up above those pillowy clouds of fog, there was a cloudless blue sky. And yet Paul tells us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, that I has not seen the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Nor ear heard. Have you ever been camping in the woods and you woke up in the morning to the sound of the birds singing, welcoming another day of life? Did you know the scientists still don't know why birds sing in the morning? But as the sun banishes darkness, you hear their voices heartily welcoming another day. Have you ever been lying in bed on a summer's night with your window open and you could hear the sound of crickets chirping in the distance or frogs croaking? Have you ever heard water trickling over the stones in a brook? The wind blowing through the trees? The ocean's waves rhythmically pounding against the shore and then receding in a moment of silence. A whippoorwill's lonely cry on a moonless night, rain beating on a tin roof, thunder rolling in the distance. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him smell of a rose, mom's bedtime stories, going hunting with dad, all the stars you can see at night in the desert, the bluebells of Texas in springtime, chocolate cake, watermelon, wrapped Christmas presents, logs burning in a fireplace, the smell of freshly cut grass, winter snow, sledding with friends, dolphins, tigers, buffalo, freshly baked bread, the smell of mom's pumpkin pie baking at Thanksgiving, mamma's molasses cookies, brownies, chili dogs, toothpaste, shaving cream, contact lenses, Jimmy Stewart, John Wayne, C.S. Lewis, Macbeth, Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, Saturn's rings, the color spectrum, cumulonimbus clouds, a sunset, a harvest moon rising over the Potomac, a baby's soft skin, a woman's perfume, the Bible in a language you can understand, getting a letter or an email from a friend, Monopoly games, swimming, going to the movies, spades, popcorn with real butter, football games, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. With all that we've experienced, we haven't experienced anything yet. 
And that's a truth we need to remember, a truth we need to reflect on. That all the blessings God has given, which really are beyond counting, are only the foretastes, only the hints of what's to come. Let's pray. I want you to take a few moments now and thank God for the blessings of your life. And I'd like for you to be specific with Him. Don't just thank Him for food. Thank Him for the kinds of food you love. Don't just, just thank Him for nature. Thank Him for the specific things you love in nature. Thank God for the blessings in your life. Name them one by one as the gospel hymn encourages us. And while you're doing that, maybe you're with us today and you haven't yet come to truly know this God who is good. This God whose love for you was so great that he gave his own son. God the son took on human flesh. He became a man. He lived the life that you and I live with one exception, no sin. And then he gave that sinless life on the cross so that our sins might be forgiven. Through Jesus' death, we can know life. Of course, death couldn't hold him, and on the third day, he rose again, giving us a picture of that resurrection that we will all one day experience. And it's all because of Jesus. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. It's all because of Jesus. That's why we have that hope. And so if you are with us this morning and you don't know if there's ever been a time in your life where you've truly come to God and said, God, I'm a sinner, but I believe that you love me. And I believe that through Jesus, you've done something about my sin. I believe that he paid for my sin on the cross and that through him I can find forgiveness. And the hope of a forever with you. And I want that, God. I want that forgiveness. I want that relationship with you that only comes through Christ. If there's never been a time in your life where you've truly prayed a prayer like that and you do want that relationship with God through Jesus, if you would raise your hand, I will lead you in a prayer of commitment. I'll pray the words aloud. You can repeat them silently to God right where you are. All you need to do is raise your hand. You may not be sure where you stand with God, but you want that assurance that you know Him that you'll be with him forever. All you need to do is raise your hand. Father God, I thank you for the, the beauty and the wonder of Jesus. I thank you for the sinless life he lived. I thank you for the love he showed when he laid down that life on the cross in order to pay for our sins. 
I thank you for the glory of his resurrection and the hope that we have because of his resurrection, Lord. And I thank you, Father, that the message of Jesus has gone out into the world these 2,000 years and that so many have come to place their faith in your Son. Father, if there's someone in this room who hasn't yet come to know Christ as Savior and Lord, I pray for that person's salvation. I pray that you would continue to move in his or her life to draw that person to you, Lord. And for those of us who do know Jesus, Lord, help us to live a life of joy, a life of expectation. Thank you so much, God, for the hors d'oeuvres that you've given us here on this earth. But Lord, thank you so much for the banquet that's waiting. Thank you for all the blessings of life, Lord. Thank you for life, breath, and all things. And we offer you this praise and thanksgiving. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.